so on behalf of the BCS, uh, our purpose is to make IT good for society, right? So I think it's good to have that as a setting. And we're delighted as part of this uh, specialist group to organize this event. And our purpose is to leave no one digitally behind, right? And I hope that you can see that connection there. And of course, I'm also delighted that the, uh, the CEO of um, the Digital Poverty Alliance, uh, Paul Finnis, is also here with us. And, and the, the DPA's mission is to end digital poverty by 2030, right? So you can see we're all working very hard to try and find a way to to address this really complex uh, uh, topic, right? Digital inclusion, exclusion, participation, divide, whatever label you use, right? They affect all parts of society. It affects all parts of our lives, whether professional or, or personal, right? Um, and just so you know, this is a series of events that we've organized. And then most recently, we've organized a, a few around, and it just to be sort of inclusive, yeah, we sort of talk about things such as uh, autism, dementia, and very soon, I see Jason joining us. We'll be working with the uh, WCIT to be doing something around homelessness. So there's a lot of things that's coming up. But let me not take up too much time. What I want to do is to, first of all, uh, thank um, the support of BCS Women and Neurodiverse IT Specialist Groups, as well as the Hampshire and Dorset Branch for organizing this. And today's webinar is on digital participation for all, what we can do to support older people. Right, so please let me introduce uh, Leela Damodaran. She's the Professor uh, Emerita of Digital Inclusion and Participation at Loughborough University. So if there's such a thing as a professor of this topic, she is it, right? So really delighted that we've got a real expert here to, to talk to us about this. And she's done a lot in her career. And for me to read out what she's done, is gonna take the whole webinar. But let me just call out a few things, right? She was commissioned by the DCMS in 2018 to develop the Digital Engagement What Works Toolkit. Right, and due to the pandemic uh, and subsequent financial constraints, that publication has yet to happen. So we, we want you to know that you know she's done a lot of work there. She was also a member of Ofcom Strategic Advisory Board, a member of Digital Inclusion Stakeholder Group, and and uh, there's lots of things that she's done. The most significant one, in my view, today is that she's a founding member of this BCS Digital Divide Specialist Group. On that note, Leela, over to you, and looking forward to your presentation today. All right, thank you very much indeed, Freddie. Um, it's, uh, he's given a lovely, flattering introduction, um, but he hasn't also added that um, I've kind of morphed into my data. I've been researching older people and their relationship with, the, with technology for a very long time. And in the past, when I started researching it, it was about investigating other people's experiences. Now they rather reflect my own, especially things like short-term memory limitations and so on. So it's been an interesting journey. Uh, it's a huge topic that I'm attempting to tackle today, uh, enabling digital participation for all. Uh, so we've decided to, with Margaret and with Freddie, to focus on what we can do to support older people. Um, it's a very good starting point because numerically, they are, pro, they are by far the largest group of uh, excluded or marginalized digital users. Um, so it's a great place to, to begin. Next. I'll do a bit of scene setting first uh, and look at some of the basics, the benefits of digital participation and in particular ask the question, why are so many, miss, so many missing out? and look at the research evidence from the Susset project and elsewhere, which focused on that, which looked at reasons why people uh, are not involved, are not participating in the digital world. And then the uh, important part of the meeting, I suppose, is the what can we do to close the digital divide? Um, and I have to say, I'm very excited by the fact that both the DPA and the uh, special specialist group of BCS have put a time on this. They're actually saying they hope to achieve change by 2030. And I think this is excellent. I hope we can do it faster, but it's good to have that, that very clear target. Um, and I must say it's, it's very exciting to see organizations like the DPA coming together with the uh, BCS specialist group to really organize and make sure that there is impact at high levels uh, and, th and throughout society really. 
Um, we've been talking about this for a very long time. Um, I've had several attempts to find out when the term digital divide was first coined and can't actually find, nobody's taking credit for this. So if anybody knows, I'd be very interested to hear from you, yeah, but yeah. certainly the first Clinton administration used that term. So the issue has been known about for a very long time, which therefore makes it very concerning that we have made relatively little progress. So I'll get on to, uh, well, I hope to, I'm hoping in retrospect, this is a very exciting landmark event uh, when, and we can look back on it at a, as an event, as an occasion, when real change started to happen and hopefully happened fairly quickly. So the, and I will also talk about what happens next, the next steps uh, and, and invite the, the contributions of everybody who's listening to this webinar and obviously far wider than that. So uh, if I could have the slide, the next slide, please. Some of the basics here, uh, a depressing statistic uh, is that 11 to 13 percent of UK adults do not use the, the internet. And this has not changed for a long time, might change by a percentage or two, but we're still talking very big numbers. Um, in 2019, Ofcom again also saying one in three adults never use a computer to go online. Now, since I definitely don't want, want to get into arguing statistics uh, this evening, um, but during the pandemic, there were very confusing, very different kinds of measures being used, uh, ways of looking at it. Um, and uh, Ofcom has moved to counting households rather than individuals. So it all makes the issue quite difficult to compare. The only thing we need to hang on to and be sure about is that there are far too many people excluded or marginalized. It's be becoming increasingly evident that existing approaches that we're very familiar with can only help those for whom they are appropriate, more or less by definition. They're meeting the needs of certain people and completely missing out a lot of others. And the pandemic has been a really impressive wake up call, signaling the urgent, urgent need for a new approach. You know, many of the things that I'm talking about have been known about for at least a decade, if not rather longer, but we haven't acted. Um, now, I hope you are, are familiar with or will enjoy the, the quotation that's on here. Um, I was addicted in the 80s to listening to uh, inspirational, motivational tapes. And a lovely American quote that often came up was, if you always do, what you've always done, then you'll always get what you always got. And I think that's horribly true. Um, and it's a, it's a real argument for doing things differently. And as I say, I'm hoping today will be an event that we can look back on and see that we really achieve change. So next, please. Um, you'll all be very familiar with the lists of uh, benefits of digital part participation. I won't go through them all. There are key ones like increased contact with family and friends, uh, increasing your economic and life chances, uh, addressing personal health, etc. Every aspect of life is in influenced and we can benefit from the use of digital technologies. Next. Next. So while all of you involved in this uh, webinar will be experiencing all, if not all those changes, all those benefits, many of them, but we know from the stats that not everyone is enjoying these benefits. And it raises the massive question of why. And it's to address that question that a number of years ago, the Susset project was conceived and I shall therefore spend a bit of time talking about that. Next. The title, the full title is Sustaining ICT Use by Older People to Sustain Autonomy and Independence, known as the Susset Project. And it was a three-year investigation uh, into digital participation of older people and how to sustain ICT use. And I'll spend the next 
five or ten minutes looking at some of the detail of that. Next. The, uh, I won't take you through, the, I really want you to know that this information is there for you to look at later. Um, the very interesting thing is that the Susset project was funded, the New Dynamics of Aging program was funded by all five research councils. Now, all of you in academia will know that uh, conflict and competition is the norm, so quite remarkable to have this level of cooperation here. Next. Uh, I don't expect you to be able to read this slide. The important thing I would like you to note is that this is obviously a map of the UK and you'll see a, a whole range of organizations who were involved in the Susset project and th th representing many older people. And these older people we regarded as research participants. So they ju weren't, weren't just people that we thrust questionnaires in front of and ask them to fill in surveys. They were part of the thinking, the working, the activities of the project, uh, which makes a number of the findings particularly powerful. There are about a thousand of them involved in all. Next. The, I want to uh, encourage you to look carefully at a number of, at the first two of these questions, because in my view, None of us who begin planning what, what, what in quotes, interventions uh, or pilots, projects, what have you, uh, with older people or with any other disadvantaged and uh, uh, di digitally excluded people should embark upon such a project without knowing, without thinking about and examining what actually are the problems and support needs that you're trying to address what are the real issues and not base this on your own assumptions or widely held assumptions. There are just so many myths out there. And also to look at what percent potential solutions are available or could be developed and involve older people in, the, in exploring these. So important research questions then, but important research questions, important questions for anybody embarking on work in the sphere. Next. Two things, two major things emerged from the Susset findings. And these are two critical success factors for digital participation. Uh, one is the design of hardware and software. I shall not attempt to say much about this in today's session, um, though there is a little bit in the case study that we'll look at in a moment. The other major finding, which will occupy the bulk of today's presentation, is the quality and availability of learning opportunities and the nature of help and support is absolutely critical for success with digital partic participation. And we need to really major on that in our responses. Next. Uh, barriers to uptake for older people are the, the, the very fundamentals of the aging process. Um, I can't see you all, but the age, anybody over 40 in the audience will be aware at some level of these issues arising in their own lives. Eyesight, reducing, or changing, hand dexterity, mobility possibly, um, psychological and cognitive changes. Um, as young as in your mid 40s, uh, multitasking becomes harder. Some of you may be experiencing that already. So there are cognitive, psychological changes that occur, particularly affecting memory, confidence, et cetera. Um, and these just go with the aging process at varying rates. Uh, other key changes happen, social changes such as family members moving away. Uh, if one of those family members is the person who supports you in your use of digital technologies, that is obviously a major blow. Technology changes, the endless new versions of familiar things, um, the uh, extraordinary experience of updating constantly a feature of frustration for many of us oldies. Yet, despite these barriers, there are many older people who are enthusiastic and successful users of ICTs, and we really need to keep sight of that. But they may often, often do find it hard to sustain their digital participation 
without appropriate support, and we'll spend time on that. Next. So some specifics about the support needs. Over 56% of older people surveyed said that support of family and friends was the most important factor in enabling participation and sustaining participation in the digital world. Next. And by courtesy of the Spice Girls, what older people really, really want, and this came through loud and clear from workshops that we ran, from investigations of various kinds, they're looking for ICT support that meets all of these things. Readily available and trusted, developed, delivered in welcoming local venues, embedded in social activities, free of time pressure and assessments, sustained and ongoing support, inclusive of problem sol solving, troubleshooting, all the things that endlessly go wrong uh, and give you a headache with using technologies, help with all those things. And Im impartial opportunities, ways of getting advice and help, uh, try before you buy, etc. Next. What older people actually want, actually get, is a long way from what they want. Very patchy availability and quality. Um, if they're lucky, they'll be somewhere in the neighborhood that's open for a couple of hours, maybe one day a week, a bit longer if they're lucky. There'll be limited access, lack of impartial advice. If they go into any of our major retail stores, they're likely to get fresher to buy, uh, likely to be sold something that maybe doesn't really meet their needs. Reduced access in some areas. We've seen libraries closing for years now. Um, they'll be faced with skills training that's actually designed for the workforce rather than for empowering the excluded and enhancing their quality of life. They'll be familiar, they'll be experiencing very short term things, interventions, taste sessions, trials and pilots, et cetera, et cetera. And most of these emphasize getting online rather than sustaining connection in the long term. Next. If you take a step back and think about what you experience in the workplace when you're employed, uh, there will be a lot of help available. You may not be very aware of it because you take it for granted, but you will get help in the workplace at no personal cost to you as an end user. Similarly, if something goes wrong with your, uh, the device you're using, it'll be quickly, or maybe not quickly, but it'll be dealt with. Someone else will look after it. It's someone else's problem. You'll have access to free training. The internet will just be provided. It'll just be there as a matter of course. You won't be having to uh, select and choose the platform that you need. Um, spam filters, virus protection, updates, hardware maintenance. There's a very, very long list that lay behind the selection of these few items. There are so many things that we take for granted in the workplace by way of support. Contrast this with what happens when you're home alone. You've retired, you're long-term sick, you're unemployed, whatever the reasons. You're home alone and none of those things apply to you. And yet people seem to be surprised at the numbers of digitally disadvantaged, marginalized people and who are not online. None of those things, you have to work them out for yourself, pay for them yourself, uh, get someone to help you with them. And obviously in very many cases, that's simply beyond the means of individuals. So it doesn't happen and people are not part of the, the digital world as a result. Next. So we see that those who need the most help, in fact, get the least. And the big question for the specialist group on this webinar and its partners like the DPA, what can they collectively, what can we collectively do to change that? And that's what the, the rest of well, much of today is about. Next. So what can we do to close the digital divide? And starting with, what can we do to support older people? Next. I'm going to use this absolutely fascinating, inspirational case study that was written 
by the daughter of an 84 year old lady who was living alone in lock lockdown and really quite seriously isolated. Her daughter set her up with an iPad to reduce her isolation so she could see her grandchildren. She had never used ICT before. Really think about that. Her daughter selected an iPad because of its larger screen, ease of use, adaptability for poor eyesight. They also tried to do things like to set up her NHS app, but Maureen doesn't have a driving license or passport. So it required additional support from her GP to do this. Maureen's daughter was, says of herself, introducing my mum to her iPad was incredibly hard work. Her first response was usually negative, followed by her anxiety that she will click on the wrong thing. Next. She has since explained that the negativity is due to her frustration at not finding any of it intuitive when to, all, to, to us all it is. If there's anything we don't know, we try click, clicking on buttons or arrows that we think might resolve our issue or Googling to find out. When she lifted the screen lid for the first time, she told me her heart was racing. Her fear was very real. Other design challenges included the need to press harder than she comfortably could on the home button. Uh, puzzlement as what finger recognition was. Um, didn't know what the family meant when they told her to touch the button on the iPad in order to unlock it. Um, keeping the device charged as it required uh, was, was challenging because that required finding a tiny hole in which to plug the cable. It took a few failed attempts at FaceTime before Maureen was able to respond to an incoming FaceTime call. This was a huge challenge, might not, was a huge triumph rather, as these calls became very critical as lockdown deepened. Her daughter said, my mum having an iPad or smartphone is as important as having an emergency pull cord. It's her lifeline to stay connected. Um, I do urge you, those of you who are interested in what holds people back to look at the case study as it was written. I'm trying to, I can't do it justice in the time that we have. In the next, next slide, please, Margaret. In this slide, we try to summarize some of the issues the barriers experienced and the solution, uh, but I'm gonna to have to leave you to read them later. Next slide. So why does support from family and friends work? Why is it something that is quoted as a critical success factor and for its, its influential situation? And it's because there are many reasons, but a major one, that it's embedded in a social process. You're chatting for someone you know well, and the digital, the, the digital aspects of it may be one tiny part of a conversation or time spent with them. It generally takes place in a comfortable setting, somebody's sitting room, uh, uses older people's language, does not require the older person to fill in forms, pass assessments, pay charges, which are often a feature of uh, places where they're attempting to teach people such skills, digital skills, uh, usually trustworthy and compassionate companions, and usually able, because they know the older person, they're usually able to demonstrate and indicate clear advantages of digital technology that are relevant, which is quite hard to do in the abstract. Next. So what does all this evidence tell us? If we try to combine the, the lessons from this inspirational case study and from the extensive research and reviews of good practice, it's, it's very encouraging to see that common themes emerge regarding both the barriers that exist and what works to overcome them. It can feel, oh, the, the, the issues to do with digital exclusion can seem so huge if it looks like there's no pattern to them but we see a very clear cut pattern to these. There are common barriers which are documented time after time. There are often not enough uh, attention given to the stress and fear, but there are access issues, issues and problems, issues to do with low confidence, a support void, stress and fear, poor design, 
perceptual, motor, and cognitive challenge, co cognitive challenges. And these are well known about. We we they're, they're not any kind of surprise. They're well documented. Have been researched for a long time. What works is ease of access. Just to know there's a device there that you can you can make use of. Um, empowering users, appropriate design, light touch admin, continuity of in-person support at home in the, in, and in the community, uh, and uh, maybe above all, but certainly importantly, building confidence. Next. So solutions that people actually want, and these come from the thousand plus individuals involved uh, in the Susset project and reinforced by many, many projects and much of the experience uh, during lockdown. Community-based support venues, which are informal and welcoming and offer opportunities to drop in for coffee, meet friends, pursue hobbies, learn skills in a new and relaxed setting. Um, and very importantly, ex ex escape the angst of digital participation at home, the fear of pressing the wrong button, doing the wrong thing, um, something going wrong and you having no idea how to resolve it. You're on your own. There isn't in the workplace, you can turn to your colleague and say, what's this all about? And that'll get solved very quickly. You don't have that at home. Next. So support, it's support the embedding support involves creating community hubs located in welcoming and, and uh, comfortable local venues, uh, using language familiar to the older person. Readily available, trustworthy and compassionate, free of time pressure and assessments. I make no apology for the repetition of that one. They are very serious turnoffs for many older people. Good connection, free or affordable broadband and mobile signal and, and or Wi-Fi appropriate hardware devices, phone, tablet, whatever, uh, they're there and they're available for you. Next. Other key features are formally trained tutors and informal peer support. Um, often I get, the, the, I get asked about, well, surely it's very expensive to, to set up uh, hubs and venues like this. Um, because of how do you find formally trained tutors you either have to pay or they're volunteers but you still have to pay for their training and that is absolutely true but what is often ignored is the power and the, the influence and help that informal peers give very very it might be at very simple levels um, like how to send a, a text how to receive a text even um, and that's that the, the, there's a lot of help around from other more informed people. So really important that you think of that combination of formal trained help and informal peer support. Um, again, the no form filling assessments or charges locally run with ongoing dialogue with users, responsive to local needs and local assets. In other words, both recognizing what the needs are and recognizing what you can exploit in the community. I mean, the exploit in the best possible way. Um, uh, to, to assist the problem solving. Applying established and ethical good practice, being sustainable ongoing. One of the nightmares of for older people is the short termism. Um, they'll, be, they'll go very enthusiastically to some event put on by uh, a local IT company. They'll enjoy it. They'll enjoy being shown what what's being demonstrated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they, it's very successful but then they never see them again, or it's a long time before it happens again. So sustainable and ongoing is absolutely crucial. Utilizing help from local councils, from businesses, schools can be wonderful, the third sector, all sorts of uh, important ventures going on there and other organizations. So there's, all, there's a lot going on. There's a lot that's possible to um, embed in the community. Next. Engaging older people in setting the agenda is really important. Uh, they can enhance lives of older people in so many ways, solving their problems, whether they're financial or booking their holidays or getting, uh, uh, getting advice on a medical condition, um, help them to manage their lives, enhance their well-being, 
engage with friends, pursue their passions, et cetera, et cetera. But identifying and meeting such needs is key to encouraging usage uh, and uh, to, to update take off technology. Um, but unless you know those things, unless you engage them in setting the agenda, it's very easy to take um, a, a view of what they ought to know from your perspective, whether that's from an employment angle or uh, get claiming benefit or whatever. Next. Uh, an example of good practice that's been going since 2005 um, is that the Long Eaton 50 Plus Forum, uh, they have developed a, a, what they call the, the Susset Drop-In and Computer Club. And I do encourage you to look on their website because there are various talks and presentations. Uh, this is a very quick um, overview of the kinds of things that people want to learn are using Skype is up there as one of the really key things, especially to be able to see the grandchildren, um, finding out how to use their mobiles. Uh, a lot of people have mobiles, but use a tiny, you know, are not aware of many, many features, or if they are aware of them, don't really know how to use them. Um, online shopping, of course, price comparisons, planning and booking travel. Um, so many things that people want to do and choose to do. So the idea that we keep being told that they're not interested is simply not true. Next. There's this wonderful observation made as long ago as 2011 um, by Adam Hillmore from the DWP uh, at a conference looking at some of the emerging issues at the time. And I love this quote, we should not consider increasing online presence among older people on its own. It is easier to bring people together as a community and to make using the internet part of that. And if there was nothing else you take away from the session than that quotation, it is so powerful because it's about saying, advertise the coffee and cake. And by the way, there'll be computers around um, or not even saying that. Uh, allowing people to use them, explore them when they feel ready, when they have questions about it, et cetera. The coffee and cake and community is the really crucial starting point. Next. Um, we're wonderful at turning people off. Um, fixed appointments are a real problem for many older people. There's often the belief that older people have nothing to do uh, the fact of the matter is they are usually very busy with a whole host of things, whether it's looking after grandchildren, uh, looking at caring for a spouse or, uh, or another member of the family, uh, looking after uh, having to cope with a whole variety of um, the limiting health conditions that go with aging. Uh, you are very busy, believe me. Um, what they also dislike and do not welcome a standardized formal instruction. Form filling and assessment are absolutely disliked, both in terms of the time they take up and the intrusion and the use of unfamiliar or threatening language or terms. Now, time after time, these, mis these things are done without any understanding of the implications. There are so many very well-intentioned uh, efforts to involve and include uh, older people in, in the digital world, but these are massive turnoffs. Next. So I hope that we have the basis for making a powerful, a, a different approach. To achieve digital participation of many of the excluded or marginalized 11 plus percent of society really requires something different. A needs-based solution embedded in the community appears to, there is so much evidence, especially gained through the pandemic about this is the way to go. We already have the know-how, the idea that we need to do more research to find out, it's just not true. We have user specified needs. They've indicated very clearly what they want. 
there is good knowledge of the common barriers to the adoption of digital technology and also of what works to overcome those barriers. There's a proposition for community-based hubs that came out of the, um, the, the awareness of, of the value of community-based hubs came out of the SUSIT project um, and detailed working out of a proposition for creating them. A strategy for digital participation for all. The pandemic has given unprecedented impetus for us to apply this knowledge. So it's all just sitting there. What are we waiting for? And I hope that this session will, will actually consider that. Next, please. So summing up the key re requirements to really, really make uh, some progress on uh, closing the digital divide that you're looking for a solution that is community-based and it's socially embedded, based on the understanding and meeting real user needs, following the user's agenda, not government's agenda, not the employer's agenda, but the user's agenda. Meeting people where they are, and by that I mean both psychologically, cognitively, where they're at in their level of understanding, but also physically, going to them, don't expect them to come to you. Applying good practice, there's a lot of it about, especially again during the pandemic. Adhere to an ethical code of practice. We do not have the right to frighten older people, make them feel intimidated, make them feel embarrassed by their lack of knowledge. We need appropriate design and we need easy access to devices and support. And it's wonderful to see all the work of the DPA going on uh, in that area. Next. So the core challenge for this Closing the Digital Divide Specialist Group and its partners and collaborators is to apply all these lessons from research and good practice to support older people and other disadvantaged groups in making use of digital technology. We know the stuff, it's sitting there, we need to use it. Next. So the challenge, we basically need to be changing our mindsets and our habits acknowledge past mistakes, work on exploring and understanding users' needs, challenge your own assumptions. You think you know that you're doing something good or proposing something good. How do you know that? How do you know, have you actually tested that out with a group of older people? Do you know that what you're offering is actually something that they need or is sufficiently high on their list of concerns and agenda that they are ready to invest in it? Work on older friendly design. Um, make this a rewarding task for bright young IT professionals looking for a crusade, looking for something that is really worthwhile, not more of the same. Um, and you can just get, I know from some of the things our students have produced, you can get marvelous designs, really exciting things that, uh, that help older people. Stop doing all the things we know are barriers to people, older people going digital. And finally, meet real needs by knowing what we know works. We don't need much guesswork in this area. There's just so much expertise. So the next steps are to develop awareness of the real needs of older people, promulgate this with use of tailored educational materials, videos, workshops, etc. Um, include lots of that in the user experience training that's becoming increasingly prevalent. Encourage all BCS members and everybody else who plans to initiate activities to enable digital participation to first develop knowledge and understanding of the intended users needs and goals. Learn something about the aging process and what is actually required. Individuals needs, what are they trying to achieve? What can digital technologies actually offer them. The BCS specialist group to develop and host a program of follow-on events that do all of those things, that meet those needs on the policies, the strategies, the guidance and training, ethical codes of practice. Um, a future webinar that we're uh, planning with Freddie is closing the is digital divide, a strategy for making digital participation a reality for all. And there is loads of material there. We don't need research very much. It's there, it's about helping you access it and making use of it. And finally, implementing strategy 
for delivering digital participation for all. Maybe starting with older people, but that's the basis for all, including everyone. Next. So thank you very much for listening. Um, uh, acknowledgements to the research councils as a, a con contractual obligation to do that. Um, uh, but above all, a real pleasure to acknowledge my colleague, Wendy Olford, for her profound insights into digital in disengagement based upon watching her uh, elderly father, a, a very IT uh, able individual, gradually use that, lose that capability. And that inspired the Susset project. So a huge thank you to Wendy. And thank you, an enormous thanks to Freddie for leading the vision of the crucial role that the BCS can have, does have in closing the digital divide. So thank you. And the next, it's over to Freddie to lead the Q&A. So thank you all very much for listening.